Well, hello there, and welcome to my video on natural dyeing with Coach Neil and Marigolds. I mean, I've been dying to make this video for a long while. I'm not an expert by far, but hopefully we can have fun and learn something from working with this dye. I plan on making three colors, red, purple, and yellow. Although, to save you from the surprise at the end, which is such a Douglas Adams move, um, I made purple, more reddish purple, almost to the pink side, and yellow. So, not quite red. Now, on with it. I was hoping to dye my skirt red. It turned out pinkish purple, which that's fine with me. It, it's kind of pretty. Uh, a length of cotton purple, which it did. And my rebozo yellow. I'm going to be working outside because I really don't want to get this stuff on the floors, on my floors or my stove. I mean, come on, wooden floors with water generally not a good idea plus I'm going to be having to run this outside to hang up on the hanging place which I am using which is essentially a fence and you know it's just easier if you work closer to the place that you're going to be hanging things it's just nicer to work outside with some of these kind of things because they can tend to smell bad I'm not doing this inside. Fortunately, I have a wonderful workbench that I made out of old reclaimed wood. Um, it looks terrible and rustic, but it works and it weighs a lot. First things first, I need to get power outside to the workbench. To do this, I ran a decent extension cord. Not one of those light Christmas light extension cords that are all, you know, blah, 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 blah. No, you need a pretty decently heavy one so that you can get enough power out and you're not going to be shorting things out or starting fires. That way I can use my hot plate on the workbench. Then I needed to gather my materials. So, you know, gathering my materials together isn't that hard. I have a tiny place. So I just needed to get my mordant, which I used alum this time. My dye, which was cochineal. Later on I actually used marigolds. They pretty much lived in my car because it's nice and hot and they stayed dry in there. And my pots. I started soaking my textiles in the water in a you know, random five gallon bucket. It worked beautifully. During this video, you'll see my cats. They tend to sneak around and be cats during the video. I hope you enjoy finding them as much as I enjoyed finding them while editing the video. Next, I started my mordants. Mordants are substances that help dye become more or less permanent and not wash out of fabric, yarns, or fibers. I have several different types of mordants. They were given to me by a lady in this class that I was taking on like magic in ancient societies and she gave me a ton of stuff including you know dye stuff the mordants and some weaving things and I will be forever grateful to her for this um, some of the stuff I'm pretty sure is straight out of the 80s especially the chemicals and um, one of these chemicals I will never ever use because it's super not good for you it's like poisonous and a carcinogen and a bunch of other stuff and it's also hard to dispose of and there's another one which I'm actually not sure if it's tin or if it's iron and we'll get to that here in a minute when I show you the mordants anyway here they are so I'm going to be using alum now alum or al aluminum potassium sulfate there's actually an another version of it which is I think citrate or something anyway this one is used in a lot of dyes. It works great. I've used alum for dyes before. I like it because it's not as toxic as the other mordants I own. It's been used since ancient times for fixing dyes. Pliny the Elder describes it in his book, The Natural History. The next one is copper sulfate. It is used to help with bright greens. I've, I've used it before and boy, does it make a green. Uh, it is kind of toxic, so you really don't want to eat it. Uh, you also, you know, don't really want to, like, just throw the water out into your garden, even though it is used as a, an augment for plants. It's just, 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 just don't do it. Don't do it. You want to be safe. Always read the white papers on your chemicals that you're using. Chrome. We don't use chrome anymore. Just going to say it. If you have chrome, don't use it. Find a way to dispose of it if you can safely, which means you need to go talk to like the chemical waste disposal or whatever. Um, I'm probably going to have to go figure out how to deal with, deal with mine. It, it's a proven carcinogen, and it's just, yeah, no. Iron. Iron can be used to darken dye. It also 
it's just it works very well you it's also very easy to make all you really need is some old nails to do it you can also use you know uh, iron sulfate if you want to but you got to be careful because it can weaken fibers especially wool and silk and make them brittle which is not fun i mean you can even you can even make it by just making your dye in an iron pot so there you go and then tin as according to my sources makes a clear and fat very fast color which basically means it's it's a very good looking color bright clear and very permanent Use just a little, be careful with tin. With all of these, you should be using caution and a respirator, and please read the white papers. Um, you can usually find those on any chemical site. I believe it's on the CDC website, or not disease control, but you know, wherever you can find poison control or whatnot on there. There are others out there, but not anything that I have. First thing I did was heat up the water and add the alum. I was going to create the dye right away with the alum in it, which you can do. I had been reading some stuff and I didn't feel like I should. So I just did the soaking thing in, in the mordant, which reminds me I need to go put a t-shirt in for my aunt. It seems to work pretty good. It seems to work better if the cloth was mordanted before dying, as far as I can tell. So I let it dissolve and added the, my material. Then I uh, put, I, I let everything heat up for a bit and transferred it to the bucket for overnight. It stayed there for a couple of days because I had to go help with a family member and other uh, obligations before I could get to my dyeing. Now is where I should tell you about the different kinds of dyeing. So really there are more than one different way of, you know, getting your dye onto your fabric. And there's different terminology for those. So we have dyeing in the wool, which is basically you dye wool which hasn't been spun yet. We also have dyeing in the yarn which is, you guessed it, sp spun yarn being dyed. And we have dyed in the cloth. Now dyeing in the cloth is what it sounds like. You basically dye a piece of cloth that's already been spun. It's not always done like this because it can, it's, it's not as high quality as say dyeing in the yarn or dyeing in the wool, but you can you can do it. It's just going to be a little bit weird more like tie-dye and there's also dyeing in the piece which is also what i did which is uh dyeing my skirt and i'll be dyeing a t-shirt here pretty soon but it's not going to be in the video i have dyed in the yarn before and i ended up with a great green um, i used juniper in the copper and it was beautiful and i've also made purple and the purple was cochineal and it is very very dark I can say that with the same batch of uh, cochineal, I ended up with a much lighter on my linen skirt as opposed to the wool yarn. And part of it, I think, has to do with the size of the skirt and the fact that it's linen. And because linen is cellulose, it has a harder time for the dyes to penetrate into the fibers as opposed to the wool, which is a protein fiber, you know, because it's made out of keratin and hair and all that. So it's a little bit easier going when you're when you're dyeing wool. And, you know, again, also my skirt was much larger. If you're wondering where I got a lot of my information from, well, the internet, of course. I will I will link to my resources in the description below, including the woolery where I bought my new supplies from. I love that place. I love to just look at that place. I'm really dying to buy some of their stuff, like some of like their spindles and a spinning. I'd love to have a spinning wheel. I would die to have a spinning wheel. <laughs> and, and oh man, I would love to have a, a decent um, loom, but, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, one thing I use for some information is a book that I own, The Textile Arts by Verla Burrell. I am sure mine is from 1979, as that's what the copyright has on it. And I'm sure it's out of print, although you can find it on Amazon. I did take a look. The first book I have, I've, I actually had for making dyes, is Dyeing with Natural Materials, Las Arañas Spinners and Weavers Guild, Incorporated. Yeah, I can't find my copy right now, but you can actually go onto their website, and I will be linking it. And you can, you can 
get a new copy if you want to. It, it's a great little book. It has recipes and techniques. I, I love it. Anywho, I have also learned a lot just from watching and listening to the diaries at El Rancho de los Colandrinas. I will leave a link to their website below. I mean, it's a shameless plug. I volunteer there. I'm literally one of the interpreters up there, the historic interpreter. And I take time and I sit and I listen, especially to the master dyers up there. Those women are wonderful. If you ever get a chance, go check that place out. It is so much fun. Of course, right now, we're going to be close to like the end of July because of all of the crazy that's going on right now. Why? Okay. So when I got back to the project because of, you know, previous engagements, I started by preparing my cochineal dye. I purchased some coffee filters to make little pouches, you know, of the, of the powdered cochineal. Cochineal is a little scale bug indigenous to Mesoamerica. It is a tiny parasitic insect found on prickly pear cactus pads. It's actually, yeah, they're pretty tiny. Uh, we only use the females for this process because, well, the males just don't live long enough to count in this regard. And eventually the bugs are harvested and dried. Just to let you know, this is not a vegan or a vegetarian process. So if you're curious about whether or not something actually has cochineal in it, look for carmine. That's pretty much what you're going to be looking for in your co carmine or cochineal extract because that is the red that you're looking for. You're going to find it in a lot of cosmetics and foods and all over the place because it's food safe. So just an FYI if you really don't want it in your food. Anyway, so I began by grinding them in my mortar and pestle, which was kind of fun because it now it's it's red. It's a very red mortar and pestle now. Um, then I put them in the coffee filter and tied them into a sachet. I heated the water up while I was doing this. It never really got to a rolling boil, but that's okay. It got hot enough. And then I put the sachets in the water and let it steep for a while. I thought about trying to dye the fabric at this point. I tried. It didn't really work. And then I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to let this stuff stay overnight before I really do too much with it. So, you know, that's, that's what I did. I let it sit until the next day. Then I heated it up again and added my uh, fabric. And it was purple. And I did let it sit for a couple of hours, you know, heating and, you know, simmering just a little bit. And then I let it cool. And then I took out the fabric and hung it to dry. The next thing I did is I added a bunch of vinegar to try to turn it red. It did turn it red, but for some reason, it just it just never quite got red. And I think it has something to do with iron leaching from my pot because it's an enamel pot with a couple of chips. Because you're supposed to acidify the dye to create the red, and it just didn't really work. And then I added my skirt and let that sit for a bit, and it didn't really work very well. So I took it out and put it back into the uh, mordant. And um, also I took out, took the cloth and let that sit for a little bit longer too, because it just wasn't, wasn't quite the purple that I wanted. So I started another pot in a stainless steel pot uh, for the red, a smaller one. I was going to make a concentration. I did the bug thing again and used my sachets to make red. And then I made the mistake of coming inside and playing a video game while I was trying to let it, you know, steep and boil. And I burned it. I burned it so bad. I was dying because I burned it. And then I had to go outside and add more water. By then, it was too dark to really do anything. So I just let everything just kind of hang out um, in the dyes and turn everything off and let it all cool down. The next day, I went out to go make my red, which, of course... By then, I had to also take my uh, cloth out of the dye and hang it up. Then I transferred the old dye into a plastic jug. Actually, it's an old kitty litter jug, but I had cleaned the kitty litter out. And um, so I could use it later, um, use the pot later. So in my other pot, I decided, oh, let's see what happens when I add some water to this. And I took the sachet out, which had already, like, it completely dissolved. So there were bugs everywhere, which was fine. I, at this point, I didn't care. And it was orange. I had made orange, and it was beautiful. So I added some uh, acid, some more vinegar to it. And it made it red and orange, and it was wonderful. But then I tried to dye my skirt, and my skirt was way too big. So I cleaned out my other pot. 
and put my skirt into the larger pot, which it ended up turning purple-ish, pinkish purple. So I have this weird pinkish purple thing now, and I th again, I think it's the pot. And I also was playing around with the other sachet that I somehow dug out of one of the pots of dye by squeezing the uh, the sachet and letting like little drops of bug juice all over everything. And it actually made some pretty cool dots all over the skirt in some places. So while I was letting that heat up and actually sit, I started working on my yellow. Now yellow is actually quite a fun story. I made this uh, with marigolds that I harvested from a huge flower arrangement that my boss got for like an award or something, or was it her tenure? I'm not really sure. I don't remember. Anyway, they were they wanted me to get rid of it. And I was like, ooh, we have some flowers I can use. So not only do we have these marigolds, we also have some neat dried flower arrangements now in my lab because I got bored. And um, also, when I was working in the dye shed with the dyers at El Rancho de los Golondrinas, I, we had actually run out of chimosa, which is this giant bush it's related to rabbit bush and snakeweed and you can actually use rabbit bush and snakeweed for these that grows around in the desert and it starts blooming in the in the fall and it has these tiny little yellow flowers and you can smell them like all over the place you harvest the little the the, the chamisa and it makes a wonderful yellow dye well we were really low on it so she was throwing in marigolds because marigolds make a beautiful yellow dye too so we were actually using the marigold and chamisa for yellow that day. And then we were also over dyeing some blue that we'd made with indigo. And for, I mean, the most wonderful greens. And, oh, I'm going to have to insert a picture here with just a picture of the dye shed and all the beautiful things that we made or that she made in the dye shed. And I, oh, just, I, I cannot wait to get back. This, this this whole lockdown thing has just been horrible. It was really, really cool. Anyway, first thing I needed to do was separate the petals from the sepals and the stem. That was pretty easy, and I put them in the water to steep for a while. I also was letting the water heat up, kind of like when you make a tea. I let it get to a boil, which this one actually did a rolling boil, which was amazing. And then I let it steep overnight after I turned it off. And then I heated it up again the next day. And the one most wonderful thing in the world is it actually smelled like chamomile tea. Like the most wonderful chamomile tea you've ever smelled. Just really great compared to the other one which smelled like. So the next day I took my skirt out of the red purple dye and hung it up to dry. And then I put my rebozo out of the, the mordant and put it in, in, in a yellow pot and heated it up. I let the rebozo sit in the water for about a day and then I took it out of the dye and hung it up to dry. At this point, I'd also rinsed my skirt in the bucket and had changed it out with just fresh water, then hung it up to dry next to the rebozo again. Then the next thing I did, which was the next day, I took everything to my friend's house to do the laundry because, you know, the next thing you do is you wash it. They are both beautiful. My rebozo still smells slightly of chamomile, which is kind of weird and kind of cool. And the color is slightly duller than it was like when it was drying, but that's totally cool with me. It's actually still a very pretty, pretty color. This project has definitely been a learning experience for me. Here are a few things I need to do or get for next time. I do believe the problem I'm having with the color has to do with the leaching of iron from chips in the larger pot. I need to get a new one. I think a stainless steel stock pot will be what I need, and I might be able to find it at the 999, which is our one of our local Asian food stores with, you know, restaurant supply in it. I plan also to get some long tongs, which would be nice. Then I don't have to, you know, have restaurant hands, which will help me out with, you know, moving things around and, you know, getting things out of the water better. I'd love to have a laundry line in my yard just so I don't have to hang them up on that fence. So I might need to get something that I can use that's retractable. Also some, you know, clips. That would be also very nice. Taking my time and letting my projects soak in the dye pots and mordant water were the best things because before I wasn't as patient. And I think this time I'll, uh, I learned something and it was better. And I got a lot of the colors that I wanted, especially for the cellulose fibers. 
I'm looking forward to wearing my kit, which because of the times that we're living in, might end up just be me going to the store in kit because why not? And I'm also looking forward to trying out Indigo, which is going to be difficult, but it will be so rewarding if I can get it to work. Please leave any comments below or questions or even advice for this kind of thing. Thank you. And I'm still learning and I hope you have a wonderful day.